Hi everyone, sorry that I'm not there today, but welcome to your very first video lecture. Um, if you do not catch the information as I am saying it through the video, you can always re-watch this video. It will be linked on our class website, or you can look at the PowerPoint itself um, and the notes will be listed underneath each slide, which you can also check on our class website. Um, so this will begin lesson 1.6, growth and conflict, America going through its growth spurt. So our very first topic today is going to be political growth and conflict. We begin with the War of 1812. Now this was initially caused because of British impressment, which to remind you is um, the practice of kidnapping and forcing people into military service for another country, as well as we were seeing an increase in Indian attacks over on the frontier. And we thought that this was the British inciting the Indians to rebel as a way for them to um, make us weaker and hopefully um, England would be able to take us back over again. As the war actually begins, we don't do very well, and it's not until the Battle of Baltimore that we start to see things go in our favor. At that point, not only do we see the turning point in the war, but we also have another very important event that happens. We actually have the writing of the Star-Spangled Banner by Francis Scott Key. He was um, being held on a prison ship in the middle of uh, Baltimore Har Harbor, and he watched through the night as the... Um, Rockets red glare and bombs bursting in air were um, going off at Fort McHenry. And um, when the light came back and, and the dawn broke, he was able to see that the Star Spangled Banner was still flying. And it inspired him to write the poem that would later on become the song that is our national anthem. When we try and look at kind of the significant battles, um, aside from the Battle of Baltimore, we also want to look at the Battle of New Orleans. This is significant for a couple of reasons. First of all, it does help us protect the, uh, the ability to hold on to the Mississippi River, which was a very important trade route for us. But it is also going to give us a very important um, leader within this war, and that is the guy that you see pictured here, and that is General Andrew Jackson, who we'll talk more about in just a few minutes. Kind of interesting thing about the Battle of New Orleans, however, is that this battle, although a decisive American victory, technically happens after the war was over. They had actually signed a peace treaty almost three weeks earlier, but because that peace treaty was signed over in Europe, the information had not yet gotten to the men out on the front lines. And so despite the fact that officially the War of 1812 is a draw, we tend to think of it as a win just because of how decisively we beat the British in the Battle of New Orleans. Now, one other point to bring up about this and kind of the significant thing about the War of 1812 is that it is also going to cause the death of the Federalist Party. The Federalists were not in favor of the war against Britain. Typically, they had been fans of Britain and liked to trade with them. And going to war with them would severely hurt the trade that we saw happening in New England, where most Federalists are from. And so they drew up a list of demands, essentially saying that America should not be able to go to war without um, greater approval by the people, and that if no one listened to them, they might think of seceding. But the problem for the Federalists is that they came up with this list and they marched it to Washington right after the war had ended and the Battle of New Orleans had been fought. And so they're coming to this where they're saying, you know, well, we demand these things, and if you don't listen to us, we're going to leave. And everybody's like, uh, guys, we already won. They kind of look like crybabies. They kind of look unpatriotic. And so because of that, people stop paying attention to the Federalists, and they do not win a single other election. The effects of the War of 1812, first of all, we gain a lot of international respect. We have beaten Great Britain, the most powerful nation on the planet, not once, but twice. And so the rest of the world really has to take notice of the United States and respect us as a real country and that we are no longer in any ways tied to the British crown. We also have a huge upsurge in patriotism. People are proud to be Americans. There is a great sense of national pride. And this is going to bring in together a period known as the era of good feelings. 
The other reason why it's known as the era of good feelings, aside from us being very proud of our country, is that because the Federalists have kind of died out as a party, that means there's only one political party. So in many ways, people thought that this meant that there was a lot of political unity and that would be good for the country. Unfortunately, it's very short lived. The other thing that's going to come from this is America trying to establish for the world that we are a powerful nation and that we are the leaders within the Western Hemisphere. And so President Monroe is going to declare the American continent closed to colonization. This is directed towards Russia and the other countries of Europe that were beginning to try and encroach on American territory. And um, we were saying, no, that's not okay. And if you do try and take us over or take over any other land, we will stop you. You will have us to answer to. This brings us to one of America's most interesting presidents, Andrew Jackson. Now, as I've already mentioned, he was a general in the War of 1812 at the Battle of New Orleans, gained a lot of attention, but he's also going to gain attention because he's known as the common man's president. He's not um, going to be born among the political elite. He was born in a log cabin to poor Irish immigrant parents. He fought in the Revolutionary War when he was only 13 years old. He is really going to be the perfect example of the common American, as well as the American ability to go from rags to riches through hard work. And so the American people really like him. However, he's not going to be successful in his very first attempt at president. And that is because of the corrupt bargain. This election in 1824 is going to pit Andrew Jackson against John Quincy Adams, the son of the second president, John Adams. Now, neither of these men wins enough votes in the Electoral College, so that means the vote goes to the House of Representatives. In the House of Representatives, the Speaker of the House happens to be a man by the name of Henry Clay, who does not like Andrew Jackson. The reason he doesn't like Jackson is largely because Jackson had beat him out in the presidential election. So this guy's extremely bitter. And so he decides that he is going to throw his support to John Quincy Adams instead. But shortly thereafter, John Quincy Adams awards Henry Clay with the position of Secretary of State, which is definitely a promotion. And that seems kind of shady. It seems like there's something a little bit off there that suddenly um, Clay is getting this promotion after he sides with John Quincy Adams. There must have been some kind of backroom deal. And so that is why Jackson and his supporters named this the corrupt bargain. And for the next four years, they would campaign against John Quincy Adams and remind the American public why they should vote for him instead of John Quincy Adams. And this is going to usher in a period known as Jacksonian democracy. Um, Andrew Jackson, as I said, is a man of the people, and he wanted to celebrate that when he had been elected. So he invited the people that had elected him to come celebrate with him at the White House. And as you can see from the picture there, it got a little out of hand. These people that voted for him were largely from the South and the West, over in the frontier. People that didn't have a lot of money or a lot of um, refinery, and so these people came in and trashed the White House in this insane party. And that scared the people that were the traditional political elite. They saw this new democracy, or as they called it, mobocracy, as being dangerous, that they didn't trust the common man with the American government. Now, the elements of Jacksonian democracy, first of all, include universal male suffrage, which means that all men over the age of 18 have the right to vote. We are getting rid of the requirement that you own property or own land in order to vote. That's no longer an issue, no longer a requirement. We also have the spoils system. Jackson believed that those that helped get him elected should be rewarded. And so let's say that you um, help get me elected. I'm gonna congratulate or I'm gonna thank you with that, um, with that uh, electoral help by giving you a position as a federal judge or as postmaster general or some other government job. Now, Jackson believed that this was a good thing for government. 
He believed it helped with turnover of new ideas and keeping a quote unquote um, ruling aristocratic class out of power, that he wanted there to be more of a voice of the common people. But the argument against it is that a lot of the time, these people were not qualified for the job. And um, that led to a lot of mismanagement as well as a lot of corruption. Finally, the people are so in favor of Jackson's new democracy that they actually renamed the Democratic Republican Party to just Democrats in celebration of Jackson. This is also going to be where they see the beginning of the use of the donkey as the symbol of the Democratic Party. A political cartoonist thought that he would poke some fun at Andrew Jackson and point out some of his um, more stubborn behaviors. And as a result, they, you know, painted him with this donkey and they were essentially calling Andrew Jackson a jackass. What was great about it is that Andrew Jackson was proud of his stubbornness and decided to take that donkey on as his own personal moniker and very quickly it became the official uh, symbol of the Democratic Party and it still remains so today. Now, things are not going to be perfect for Andrew Jackson forever. In fact, he has a lot of controversy in his administration. The first major one of these is the nullification crisis. This is going to come as a result of the Tariff of 1828 that became known to people in the South as the Tariff of Abominations. This was supremely hated because it raised the tariff rate to about 50 cents on the dollar. That means you're paying about a 50 cent tax for every dollar of an imported good that you want to buy. Now, that's not a problem for people in New England because they make a lot of their own stuff. There's a lot of manufacturing. But for the people in the South and the West, they have to import virtually everything. So their lives just got a whole lot more expensive. And so there's a lot of unhappiness over this tariff. John C. Calhoun, the vice president of the United States, is going to come out and write something called the South Carolina Exposition, in which he says that the states have the right to nullify or void a federal law if they feel that is unconstitutional. Now, I want to point out, they don't have this power. The states cannot nullify a federal law. The federal government is above the states. But this gained a lot of popularity and the people that supported the idea became known as nullies. And so these people from South Carolina were threatening secession if the tariff was not lowered. Eventually, Jackson is able to get Congress to agree to lower the tariff. However, he wants to remind the people of South Carolina who's really in charge. And so in addition to the lower tariff, he also has passed the force bill. This bill allowed the president to use military force in order to enforce the laws. Many people in South Carolina called this the bloody bill because it would allow the president to use violence against his own people in order to enforce the laws. This is going to bring us to the bank war. Henry Clay, the former secretary of state under John Quincy Adams involved in that corrupt bargain, still hates Jackson and wants to make sure that he is a one term president. So he calls for the Bank of the United States to be rechartered early. This would essentially put Jackson between a rock and a hard place. If he vetoes this, then he is going to keep Southern support because the Bank of the United States is generally hated by people from the South and the West, but those people don't have any money. And if he doesn't veto, if he signs it, then he'll get money from the North and support from the North, but he will alienate his own people that voted for him and probably lose the election. So this situation is just a no-win situation for Jackson. However, Jackson um, is smart enough to figure out kind of what's going on and he kind of sees the writing on the wall and figures out what the, um, what the entire plot is. Jackson does not like the Bank of the United States. He thinks it only benefits the wealthy. And um, he decides that he is going to pull the money from the Bank of the United States and put it into what he calls wildcat banks. These are banks out on the frontier that are very unpredictable, kind of like a wildcat. 
So that's his plan to defeat this, um, this Bank of the United States. Now, the other person that's going to get pulled into this is the president of the bus, and that is Nicholas Biddle. Nicholas Biddle is supporting Henry Clay in the upcoming presidential election, and he wants to see Clay win. So now that Jackson has pulled the money out of the state bank or out of the national bank and put it into the state banks, Nicholas Biddle is going to call in those state bank loans. And this is going to um, unfortunately force those states to call in the loans of regular farmers out on the frontier who can't pay those back immediately. It creates a national panic, um, minimal in compared to some of the others that we will see. But there is a major panic out on the frontier because those people are really going to end up struggling. What happens is that um, as Jackson is fighting this multi-headed monster, as you can see in the picture here, it's shown um, kind of similar to the Hydra of ancient Greece. Andrew Jackson is going to do everything he can to stop the Bank of the United States. And even though his actions eventually end up hurting these frontier farmers, they still elect him in the next election. And the reason that they still support him, despite the fact that they got hurt by his actions, is because he's the first person, the first president, to have ever stood up for them. However, not everybody likes Jackson. In fact, a lot of people don't. And they really hate the fact that Jackson uses the veto as a way to kind of create his own legislation. He vetoed more bills than all five presidents that came before him combined. And so because of this, people began to say that he was ruling America almost like a king. And so they began to nickname him King Andrew the First. And this is going to be the nickname given to him by a new political party known as the Whigs. This is a political party specifically created as an anti-Jackson political party. You got to figure exactly how hated this guy is that there is an entire political party created just to prove how much they hate him. Um, their other ideas were that um, they wanted to limit presidential power as kind of an example of what they didn't like about Jackson, but they also wanted to promote industry. A lot of the people that are now going to join the Whig Party had previously been members of the Federalist Party, and most of those people came from the manufacturing areas of New England. So this is going to pit, in a lot of ways, the North versus the South and the West politically again. And this finally brings us to the last thing concerning Andrew Jackson, and that is the Indian Removal Act. This will occur in 1830, and we are going to see four of the five, what we call civilized tribes, be removed in order to free up land for white settlement east of the Mississippi River. So here we have, for example, um, the, uh, the five major tribes. So here we have uh, the Seminoles that are from Florida and the Creeks, the Choctaw, and the Chickasaw. These groups are all going to be moved uh, west of the Mississippi, most of them into the Arkansas and, uh, and uh, Oklahoma area. And the Cherokee are the only ones to fight back. Now, that's not really accurate. The other ones fought back and they tried to fight back violently and it didn't work because they were going up against the U.S. Army. The Cherokee decided to fight like an American. And what's the most American thing that you can do? Sue the government. And so they brought it to the Supreme Court and they said that the state of Georgia cannot remove them from their land and the federal government cannot remove them from their land because they had treaties with the federal government. And the, um, the Chief Justice of the Supreme Court, John Marshall, says that they're right, that if the federal government wants to remove them, that the federal government has to make a new treaty with the Cherokee. To which Andrew Jackson replies, well, John Marshall has made his decision, now let him enforce it. But the judicial branch can't enforce their own rulings. It's the job of the president to enforce it. So he actually is going to go against his own presidential oath, his promise to uphold the Constitution and everything it stands for in order to remove the Cherokee. 
And this is going to lead to the Trail of Tears, which we're pretty familiar with already. The Trail of Tears is going to cause the deaths of 4,000 Cherokee as they are marched from Georgia over to Oklahoma. This is about 25% of those that had originally left are going to die along the way from disease, exhaustion, as well as um, lack of food. Our next topic is manifest destiny. Now, if you are going to do a Google image of manifest destiny, this is the first picture that comes up. And it's really a great image to explain the idea that America has the God-given right to stretch from sea to shining sea, which is what manifest destiny means. And if you look at it, you can see a lot of these ideals in the image itself. You see the angel right here where she is stretching across going from the east to the west you see her bringing all kinds of technology behind her you see telegraphs you're gonna see railroads you see stagecoaches and farmers all kinds of civilization stretching going westward and what is it chasing out the buffalo and the indian it's chasing out all of the uncivilized parts of america so just a quick review of what America has already gained in territory. We have the original 13 colonies that we will gain from Great Britain as a result of winning the American Revolution. Then we are going to gain the Louisiana Purchase Territory from France in 1803 under Thomas Jefferson, which we discussed a couple of classes ago. And then finally, we are going to gain Florida from Spain. This is actually because of Andrew Jackson when he was still a general. Um, he was supposed to chase the Indians back into Florida. Instead, he marched across the border, which could have been an act of war, but instead of going to war with the United States, Spain just figured they'd make a quick buck and they decided to sell Florida to us instead. And so that's how we got Florida. So the next step in our um, attempt to move westward is going to be the Missouri Compromise. Now, we already owned this territory. It's part of the Louisiana Territory, except for Missouri now has enough people in order to join the Union as a new state, except for they want to join as a slave state. And why that's a bit of a problem is because this is going to upset the balance of political power in Congress. Up to this point, we had had an even number of slave states and free states. And by Missouri joining, it would totally throw that out of whack. And so we didn't want to allow Missouri to come in yet. So the Missouri Compromise is going to be formulated by our dear friend, Henry Clay. Henry Clay's nickname is the Great Compromiser. And we're going to see a lot from him in the next couple of classes. Ways that he's going to try and strike a deal that other people cannot seem to get people to agree to. So what are his ideas the first part of the compromise is that he is going to try to ensure that um, missouri is able to enter in here as a slave state and then to keep that balance maine is going to come in as a free state and so the thing that is going to make this problem hopefully disappear in the future, what should solve the problem, is this bright red line in the middle, the 3630 line. This line would divide for the future those that would be free and those that would be slave. So everything that was above that territory or above that line, if they wanted to enter into the Union as a state, would have to be a free state and everything below it would have to be a slave state. And that was hopefully going to solve the problem forever. And it doesn't. 
So looking at American territorial expansion, we've covered the territory we got from Britain, from France, and from Spain. Next up, we are going to look to Texas. Mexico had invited a lot of Americans to move to Texas as a way for them to make some money, but there was a huge problem. The Americans wanted to bring their slaves and Mexico had outlawed slavery years before. And so this is going to cause a lot of friction. And eventually these Americans living in Texas, they were known as Texians, are going to fight for their independence. They are going to win their independence after some very historic battles like the Battle of the Alamo, and they are going to become an independent republic. So they then ask to join the United States, but we don't let them in initially, mainly because they want to enter in as a slave state, and that would be one big slave state. And so we needed to find something that would help balance it out. And so we weren't really quite ready for them to join the United States yet. But when they do, um, we are going to gain Texas from Texas because they were an independent country at that time. Next up, we have the Oregon Territory. Now, this was territory that both we and Great Britain both believed we had control of and that we owned. There were a lot of Americans who had moved to Oregon and um, wanted to ensure that they had American rights there, that they were not going to become part of British Canada. And so these people were demanding that America keep control over this territory all the way up to the um, 5440 line, which is basically the bottom of modern day Alaska. And they had the rallying cry of 5440 or fight. Thankfully, President Polk was a little bit more calm than these people, than these settlers, and he made a deal with Great Britain. And in this, he made the agreement that why don't we just continue on with the line that we've already set up as the border of Canada and America, the 49th parallel. And so that's how we get the territory of Oregon. It's a nice compromise deal. The last territory that we are going to get is going to be the Mexican Cession. Now, this is going to have to be, um, this is involving a fight between us and Mexico. Um, President Polk really wants to complete Manifest Destiny and reach from sea to shining sea. And the way that he plans to do that is to go to war with Mexico. However, Mexico beats us to the punch and they are actually going to attack us first. And so um, President Polk has a perfect excuse to send the full strength of the army out to the Mexican territory to fight to protect Americans. Now, while this is happening, there is also another rebellion going on in the Mexican territory, and that happened here in California. It's going to be led by a man by the name of John C. Fremont, which is why we have a city in California called Fremont. So um, Fremont or Fremont is going to lead these California rebels to gain their independence from Mexico. So part of the reason why Mexico is going to lose is because they're having to fight not one, but two battles at the same time. And so because of this, they lose the battles. They have to give the land to the United States. The United States gains the Mexican territory from, uh, from Mexico, except for California. Essentially, California is going to bring itself into the Union. Now, normally you have to be a territory, but California had just experienced the gold rush and had a ton of people move here. And so we were able to completely bypass the territory stage and join in as a state automatically. We're gonna look at this a lot more next class because California entering the union is going to be one of the big events that leads us towards the American Civil War. Our final major topic for today is going to be cultural growth and conflict. And this is kind of a big thing because we're gonna be seeing how America is growing in size, in diversity, as well as the issues that come along with that growth. So the first thing that we're gonna look at is the growth of America's population. And one of the most significant things to happen is going to be our very first mass migrations to America. The first group to come over is going to be the Irish. 
This is going to happen because of the potato famine that happened in Ireland between 1845 and 1850. Now the height of the famine was going to be in 1847 and this was going to be the height of the year of the migrations away from Ireland mainly to the United States. It was one of the cheaper passages that you could purchase. The people that were coming from Ireland were absolutely destitute, walking skeletons in many cases. These people had no money, no education, and the other thing that made them undesirable for a lot of Americans was that they were Catholic. And the vast majority of Americans were Protestant, and those two groups didn't get along at the time. A lot of the Irish moved to the very crowded slums in the major cities. They all kind of congregated in these similar places. And they really tried to assimilate into American culture to become as American as quickly as possible. And one of the ways that they were going to attempt to do that was through politics. Our other group is going to be the Germans. The Germans have their highest point of migration just one year after the Irish in 1848. Now, the Germans are going to immediately get to America and then keep moving westward. And they move and settle into the Midwest, places like Minnesota and Wisconsin and things like that. And you can kind of tell this if you've ever listened to the accents of people from Minnesota or from Wisconsin. Um, they they kind of almost have a little bit of a German accent. It's still kind of lingering still today. Um, now, out there in the Midwest, they became farmers and they continued with their traditions. They did not assimilate into American culture. In fact, some areas refused to learn English for generations. And yet, they were much more respected or accepted into American society than the Irish. Why? Because the Germans were Lutheran, which is a Protestant religion. But regardless, there were a lot of people who were very concerned with this massive migration. They were afraid that these people were going to overrun American businesses, they were going to take people's jobs, that they were going to run away with, um, with uh, American values and culture and kind of destroy those things. And this is going to cause the rise of something called nativism. This is a very anti-immigrant um, belief system that they favor quote unquote native citizens of a country. Now, they do not talk about actual Native Americans. They believe in native, as in been here a long time, white Americans, white English speaking Protestant Americans. That's who they believe are the only ones that should have any say in what goes on in the United States. And the most significant group to come out of this is going to be known as the Know Nothings. This starts off as a secret society and then eventually develops into its own political party. And this group gets the nickname of the Know Nothings because they were um, supposedly involved in some extremely violent actions against immigrants, specifically the Irish. And when questioned by police about their actions, they would say, I know nothing. But you can see this nativism in political cartoons of the time that illustrate the Irish and the Germans oftentimes as drunks, violent, and running away with the ballot box, running away with the vote and American politics. America also has a major economic growth spurt at this time, and this is going to be the market revolution. This is all going to begin with the textile industry because of a man by the name of Samuel Slater, who brought over the ideas and the blueprints for a spinning machine from England by memory. Um, it was illegal to take those blueprints out of England and he was able to actually memorize and rebuild the machine from scratch. He's known as the father of the factory system and this spinning machine starts industrialization in America. And it's going to be incredibly supported by the work of Eli Whitney. Now, most of you guys are probably familiar with his work with the cotton gin. This allowed for the production of cotton to be made extremely easy in comparison to what it used to be done by hand. The cotton gin will allow for a slave to produce 10 times as much cotton in the same amount of time. Now, um, this is going to increase the 
demand for cotton. Before that, it had not been in high demand because it was so labor intensive. And so that means that we're gonna plant more cotton, which means we need more people to pick the cotton. And thus the demand for slavery is going to increase dramatically. So it, it does impact the South a lot. But Eli Whitney's um, products are also going to impact the North. And that's gonna be with interchangeable parts. Eli Whitney was um, dumb enough to not get the patent for the cotton gin. And so because of that, he didn't make any money off of it. So he needed another job. And so he got hired by the US Army building rifles. And he discovered a major flaw that if one thing broke on the rifle, you essentially needed a whole new rifle. You couldn't fix just that one part because all parts were made by hand and thus they were all a little bit different. And he says, if we make these parts using a machine, they're all gonna be the same. And so you can replace one part of the rifle instead of the entire rifle. This is going to create the idea of machine parts or interchangeable parts that will really be the basis of the factory system. And um, it is with this idea that we are able to expand our markets and expand our manufacturing in the northern states. We're also going to see transportation improvements at this time, ways for us to get our goods from point A to point B much faster. We're gonna have things like canals, like the Erie Canal, which is shown here. Canals are a man-made river that links two existing bodies of water. And this was designed in order to get things quickly from the Atlantic to the Great Lakes, so then they can be put onto the Ohio River, brought to the Mississippi River, and then brought down to the Gulf of Mexico, and then they could be shipped just about anywhere. Mm -hmm. These things were going to make the travel of goods on the interior of America much, much faster. We also were going to build the very first national road, the Cumberland Road. Now, this is not the type of road that you and I are familiar with. It's not beautiful and paved and solid and, and level. Um, it was basically a gravel road, but a vast improvement of what we had had before. It was much wider, it was cleared, there weren't any trees in the way. And so we was going to make the transport of goods on land significantly faster than what they had been before. But both of these things are going to pale in comparison to the impact of the locomotive. Now, the original locomotive was not very powerful and it was not very um, reliable. They blew up and ran off course about as often as, you know, as they actually got to the places that they were supposed to get. But as time would go on, they would become more reliable and America would start to build more and more and more railroads. Now, most of these railroads are going to be built in the northern cities because they're the ones that are most involved in trade and manufacturing. The South, they're agricultural. They're not gonna really need this. And so they're not gonna build many. But that's actually going to hurt them a lot when it comes to the American Civil War, which we'll talk about next class. Next, we have religious revival. And we're going to have another revival. Um, and this is known as the Second Great Awakening. So the First Great Awakening happens in about the 1730s. This one happens just roughly about 100 years later. Now, this grew as a reaction to industrialization and the sin, the vices, and the greed and corruption that came from industrialization and that came from manufacturing and big business. And people believed that the world had gotten so corrupt that Jesus was going to come back. Jesus was going to come back and he was just going to rid the world of all of these negative um behaviors. And so if you didn't want to get left behind in the rapture, you needed to get up and act right and you needed to get your butt back to church. Now, what makes this different from the first one is that it is going to be much more widespread than the first one, but we're going to see a lot of similarities in the sense that they're still going to have these outdoor sermons, that it is still going to be a revival of kind of the common people. So those are things that are similar to the very first one. But um, despite being also emotional and, um, and you know, being outdoors a lot of the time, 
it's a lot more active in the sense that there's going to be more people involved, not just among all the states, but we're going to see women and African Americans leading in many cases in the Second Great Awakening. But it's also very divisive. Groups start to divide over their interpretation of the Bible and interpretation over specifically the issue of slavery. And so we're going to see new religions popping up that take one side or another when it comes to the issue of slavery. Um, it is also going to inspire a lot of other reform movements that we'll talk about in just a couple of minutes. Now, the most significant group to come out of the Second Great Awakening, the most significant new religion to come out, is going to be the Latter-day Saints, which are better known today as the Mormons. This group is initially founded by Joseph Smith. He was in an area that was known called the Burned Over District of New York. It was an area of New York that had really been caught up in this religious fervor, and um, he starts spreading this message of this new um, kind of addition to the Bible, kind of like volume two of the Bible, the, the newer New Testament um, or Latter Day Testament. And so he starts spreading the word. He gets all of these new followers, except for they're not going to be well liked by the American public. And the reason for this is because of religious and political practices. They are um, well known for being involved in polygamy, having more than one wife. And that's because they took a lot of um, emphasis on the biblical teaching of go forth and multiply. That um, the way for them to defeat evil was to basically outnumber it, literally. Um, and so the more wives you had, the more children you could produce. They also were in trouble for a lot of political practices. They would vote as a block, meaning their religious leaders would tell them how to vote. And we as a democratic society, we just, we don't like people telling you how to vote. Your vote is your choice. And so we had an issue with that. So when these Latter-day Saints living in um, an area that actually wasn't part of the United States just yet, the area that is now Utah, um, they figured that if they ever did become part of the United States, the territory, that they would be able to become a state because they've already got enough people. But the United States wouldn't allow them, and that was because we didn't agree with these two ideas. And we told them that they were not allowed to become a state until they got rid of these two practices. It would take a lot of years before they finally agreed to do so. And immediately following that, Utah was able to become a state in the Union. A similar idea to this religious revival is transcendentalism. Now, I do not want you to believe that this is a religious group or a denomination. It is not. It's a philosophical and intellectual movement, but it has a lot of those same ideas. These people were also disillusioned with the industrial world and wanted to escape the vices of the modern world. And they figured that to understand absolute truth and to know their purpose in life and to be able to understand um, kind of the world in its purest sense, you had to get away from the modern world in the literal sense. And so um, they really looked at self-reliance and self-discipline as a way to do this. Um, and the most well-known of all these people is going to be the guy you see pictured here, that is Henry David Thoreau. He is going to be known um, very much uh, at, for his writings and his two most well-known writings. The first of these is Walden or Life in the Woods. Henry David Thoreau literally left the known world, went and lived in the woods by himself for two years to better understand himself. Um, it might seem a little weird, it might seem a little uh, a little odd for him to, to go and kind of live in the woods by himself, but what he was trying to accomplish was to get to a form of enlightenment. Not religious enlightenment, but more like philosophical enlightenment. And he wanted to be able to better understand the world around him and to understand what he truly believed. And that is going to be further shown in his other book, and that is On the Duty of Civil Disobedience. At this time, there is going to be a very strict fugitive slave law enacted. And he did not agree with it. He didn't believe in it. 
and so he refused to pay his taxes because his taxes would be used to bring slaves back to the South to a system that he did not agree with. Because of this, he was arrested. And he wrote this particular essay where he says that it is the duty of every American to disobey bad laws. This essay is going to be extremely influential in the works of both Gandhi as well as Martin Luther King. As I said, the Second Great Awakening is going to inspire a lot of other reforms, and these reforms are going to try to eliminate a lot of the different sins of industrialization, things like cruelty and war and discrimination, um, but also other sins and vices of the overcrowded, corrupt industrial cities. And a lot of this was going to fall to middle class women. Um, they're going to be highly involved in the reform movement because a, they have, as middle class women, the time and the money to do so. Upper class women are not really going to be highly involved because they benefit from the current system, so they don't really see a reason to fix it. And lower class women are too busy trying to make ends meet to do anything about it. This is also going to be inspired by the cult of domesticity. This was a new um, ideal for women that kind of arises at this same time and is one of the justifications that women use for getting involved in the reform movement. The cult of domesticity has four elements, piety, purity, submissiveness, and domesticity. Piety means you are religious, you are moral, that you are um, a good human being and you are um, a moral example to others. Specifically, it was supposed to be to your family and to your children, but it would also mean to your community. And this is one of the things that women would use as their um, justification for being involved in reform movements outside of the home. That since they are the moral compass of the family, they should also serve as the moral compass of the country. The other elements are purity. You should be pure of mind, pure of thought, and pure of body. That you should be submissive to your husband and other authority figures. And you should be domestic. You should be able to take care of your children and take care of your home. Now, these seem to be very restrictive on women, but women actually saw it as freeing in a lot of ways. It gave them opportunities and an excuse of their importance in the family rather than just, I'm my husband's wife or I'm my children's mother. They now have a grander, greater goal that they are the moral compass of the family and of their community. So we're going to have a few of these major reform movements that are inspired by the Second Great Awakening. The first of these is going to be public education. Now, this had been started in New England pretty much from the very start, but wasn't really popular anywhere else. Most people were of the thought of, why would I pay good money for someone else's kid to get an education? And that makes a lot of sense. There were very few people who had a lot of money and public education seemed kind of like it was, you know, benefiting people other than yourself. And um, because of that, it just was not a very popular idea. But as Jacksonian democracy takes on, we realize that people need to be educated in order to be better voters. And women need to be better educated so that they can teach their children to be better citizens. So public education actually benefits everybody. Now, um, some people are going to be ignored in this. For example, if you live way out in the sticks, if you live way out on the frontier, probably not gonna have much access to public education. And if you're a person of color, it's probably not gonna happen for you either. But it does definitely increase the number of people who will get a basic education than what we had seen previously. The next major reform is gonna be prison reform. Up to this point, the idea of prisons was to punish you and shame you into never wanting to commit that crime again. But these prisons were um, awful places to be. I mean, much more than you would consider a prison to be even today. Um, these men would be locked up in an individual cell by themselves 
for 23 hours a day. Then they would be brought out, they would be tied up in a group, and they would have to literally all hold on to the same rope and just walk in a circle for an hour, not talking, not looking up, not doing anything except for walking in a circle, and then they would be brought right back to their cells. And it really didn't stop anybody from committing crimes again. And so people felt that instead of punishing them, let's try and get them to actually reform and repent for their crimes. And so this is where we are going to get our first penitentiaries. And the word penitentiary comes from the word penitence, which means to ask forgiveness or to, um, to, to feel sorry for something bad that you have done. And it, it's based off of a religious term. And the idea was that you were going to teach them good Christian morals so that they wouldn't want to commit a crime again and that they would lead a better, more Christian life. We're also going to see improvements to mental health. Now, the woman that you see here, her name is Dorothea Dix, D-O-R-O-T-H-E-A-D-I-X, Dorothea Dix. Um, she is going to be the leader in the fight for greater mental, mental health facilities. At this time, if you had someone in your family that was considered insane, they would be sent to an asylum. Now, um, to be insane at that time could be anything from, you know, literally thinking you're the Easter Bunny to a woman who has postpartum depression after having a baby or someone who has um, mental retardation or somebody who um, is just, um, you know, has ADHD or something of that sort. Really just anything that was kind of out of the norm, you could be legally considered quote unquote insane. Now these asylums, if you had enough money, you could send your family member to a private asylum where they would have, you know, personal nursing care and they would be well taken care of. But if you were poorer, they would be sent to a state facility and these places were incredibly run down and they were not well taken care of and the people were treated horribly. And that was actually better than the other system that started to develop, that they started to foster out these quote unquote insane persons. And the um, people that were the foster um, caregivers many times treated these people as if they were an animal, literally housing them in cages and in the stalls in their barns, along with the pigs and the cows and the horses, forcing them to eat from the same trough as the animals. And she went undercover in order to see what this was really like. And she was horrified by what she saw. She brought it in front of her state legislature in Massachusetts, in which she said, I proceed, gentlemen, briefly to call your attention to the present state of insane persons confined here within the Commonwealth. They are in cages, stalls, pens, chained, naked, beaten with rods, and lashed into obedience. Her report was so significant in changing people's opinions that not only were the asylum systems changed in Massachusetts, but that they would be changed in all of the states within the next couple of uh, decades. So her protests resulted in the improved conditions for lots and lots of people, and that's pretty significant. Our last one of these on this page, we're looking at the temperance movement. Temperance means that you want to see people limit the amount of alcohol that they drink. These people, mostly women, saw alcohol as the cause of most of society's problems. They saw men, good Christian men, going out and getting drunk at the bars and wasting all the family's money 
or coming back drunk and beating their wives and children or getting themselves into legal trouble by getting into fights or even murdering people. And that causes problems for the family as well. So these women were trying to fight back against drinking alcohol. And um, they went through and they smashed up saloons. They would stand outside them and sing hymns trying to, uh, trying to shame the men into leaving the bars. And this movement, while starting in about the 1840s, would continue to be a significant part of the reform efforts in America from the 1840s until we actually eliminate alcohol in America in the 1920s. So this fight against alcohol as a way to try and protect America's morality has a very long history. And our final reform movement is the women's rights movement. This is going to be um, really getting started at the Seneca Falls Convention, which took place in Seneca Falls, New York. Susan B. Anthony, Lucretia Mott, and um, Elizabeth Cady Stanton are going to put together this women's rights convention. And um, they wanted to discuss what women wanted and needed in order to live a more purposeful and equal life to men. And in this, they end up writing the Declaration of Sentiments. This is very much inspired by the Declaration of Independence. In fact, the very beginning lines of it are going to include the words, we hold these truths to be self-evident that all men and women are created equal. And where in the Declaration of Independence, they list all the bad things that King George has done. He has taxed us. He has taken us out of our country for juries. He has done this, that, and the other. The women did the same thing, except for they were addressing it to men in general, that men had taken away their rights. Men had denied them a political voice. Men had denied them the right to property and so on and so forth. And they were essentially saying that the rights of the Declaration of Independence and the Constitution were not being afforded to 50% of the population. And that was just not okay. In this, they demanded equal rights and they demanded suffrage. Now, women would not gain the right to vote for another about 70 years. So this would happen in 1848. Women would not gain the right to vote until 1920. So ladies and gentlemen, we see that a lot of these reform movements are inspired by an idea based on that um, second great awakening, this idea that um, we need to be living more moral, more upstanding lives. We need to have greater equality, greater um, treatment towards our neighbors, that we need to improve our society. And while they may not seemingly be directly related to a religious movement, they definitely all have some tie to it um, as far as their goals or their inspiration. So that's it for today, and I will see you guys next class.